Cool. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, just want to start by saying, really, I guess, thanks to the conference for having me. Thanks for you guys for coming. Uh, this is my third year as a speaker, and I know every single year they do a really good job of putting on a great conference, great speakers, great food. So, you know, thanks to, thanks to the organisers and the volunteers and, and everyone else. So, scaling. Scaling is one of those things that I guess we're all kind of guilty of ignoring early on. Um, it's only kind of when the spikes start happening, when the proverbial hits the fan, and stuff starts getting slower and slower, and customers grumble more and more, and then you kind of think, yeah, I probably need to like, look at that, I guess. Um, there are lots of different ways we can scale. So all this talk really does is it looks at some of the basic approaches, some of the things that perhaps you could apply to an existing application, not just things to think about the next time you do it. So my name is Liam Wiltshire. And it says there. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> you love it when this works. Uh, hard on. You love it when a plan comes together, right? Oh, there we go. Oh. Uh, my name is Liam Wiltshire, as it says there. And I'm uh, a senior PHP developer and business manager, whatever the crap that means, uh, for a little company called Tebex. So you've probably never heard of us. I hadn't heard of us four months ago. Um, but we basically do in-game commerce platforms for sandbox games, like the one that doesn't work. <laughs> there we go. Oh, I'll leave it up there, it's fine. Uh, it's Minecraft, if you don't know. So, of course, we had to have at least one Jaws reference. This is the only one, so make the most of it now. Um, scaling is a, to is a massive topic. You, know, you really would need a very big boat to do all the hundreds of books and articles and podcasts and, and whatever else. So, you know, this is very much an introduction to the topic. We're not going to go into huge levels of detail on, on millions of different things. We couldn't do it in an hour anyway. What we will look at is some of those high-level kind of strategies that you can go through. So, we'll look at, you know, why we need to scale in the first place. What are the reasons that you're going to be doing this? Often, like I said, it's because you're already having problems, so we'll look at some of the things that you could do today, the stuff that you can do to kind of buy you some time to then do the bigger things, I guess. Um, a lot of the stuff we're going to look at is stuff that we at Tebex have done on our existing platform, um, but also some things are things that we're doing on the new product that we're currently building, things that we're going to do better the next time around. So. Because a lot of the, re the examples are based on stuff that we're doing at Tebex, I thought it'd be useful just to kind of give you a, a, very, a vague overview of kind of what our platform looks like. Um, so this isn't talking about kind of what databases we have or anything like that. This is just purely what stuff, what things make up our platform. So it starts off nice and simple. We have an admin panel. Okay, it's written in Laravel. All of two people log into it. It talks to a database. Yeah, great, fine. Then we have our customer control panel. Now, this obviously gets a lot of use because all of our customers log in and use it. Um, it does all the customer reporting. It's where customers go to set up their products, set up their categories, integrate their servers, whatever else. So it's not just pulling data in from the database, but we use some third-party services, such as Keen, to do reporting. Um, but again, you know, it's in Laravel. It's, you know, it's fine. Then it gets interesting. Every single customer has one or more web stores. Some customers only have one, and that's it, and they've only got one server, and great. Some customers have lots and lots and lots of web stores. Each web store is unique to that customer, because obviously they have their own products, and they have their own categories, they have their own content, and on the paid plans, they can also build their own templates and themes and whatever else. Um, at the moment, we have just under half a million web stores. And then it gets even more fun. Every web store has at least one Minecraft server attached to it. Some of them, yeah, a lot of them only have one, but again, some web stores might have multiple Minecraft servers if they're kind of running clusters and, and whatever else. So all these, web, all these servers phone home at different intervals depending on, uh, depending on the, the package they're on. Some of them phone home every 10 minutes, I think up to Enterprise that phones home every minute. And then any, any packages that have been bought, the commands then get pushed out as part of that phone home process to be executed on the server. 
On top of that, you can also buy in-game. So we've got these web stores, but as I said before, you can buy all the packages in-game as well. So whenever someone types the slash buy command within Minecraft, it then has to come and fetch the package list and the categories and everything else as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that gets interesting. Uh, we have somewhere in the region about 550,000 Minecraft servers connecting at the moment. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's fun. So with all that stuff, what, what, you know, what are we looking at in terms of kind of traffic? And you know, it's, it's not huge, it's growing, uh, but it's, it's enough that it's caused us problems, <laughs> I guess. Um, so on an average day, we'll serve around about half a million requests an hour. Uh, obviously, you know, a lot of our customers are in America, so kind of our late evening, early morning, often the traffic's a little bit higher, and then kind of during the day, our time, it tends to be a little bit lower. But yeah, on, on an average day, somewhere like half a million. We do get regular spikes, uh, which can be three, four, sometimes five times the traffic. Often that's like around Black Friday, Cyber so Monday, um, or when an enterprise customer launches a new product and doesn't tell us, which happens more or less every week. Um, and also, and this is one that surprised me, it wasn't the biggest spike, but just the fact it happened, I wasn't expecting it. Uh, Christmas Day. Um, at one point on Christmas Day, we served 1.2 million requests in an hour, and one of our customers made $200,000 on Christmas Day. I'm in the wrong industry. <laughs> so that's kind of our, our normal traffic. Now on top of that, something that we've noticed, which is interesting, um, is that we have this kind of continual level of a, I call it a DOS attack, it's not really because it doesn't work. Um, but there's this uh, anywhere between kind of 60 to 100,000 requests um, each hour, just, just junk requests, people just firing stuff at us, basically. Um, so, yeah, we, 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 we list it in our metrics as a DOS attack. You know, the fact it's not denying service means it's kind of not, but they try, bless them. So, like I said, the first thing we're going to look at is why do we need to scale? Uh, you know, I'm going to be honest, if I didn't need to scale, then I wouldn't do it, because, you know, why would you, right? Um, the reason we have to do it is because we've become successful. Because you know, we've built this app, and it's wonderful. And then someone sees it on Twitter. Or you know, kind of back when I started in web dev, it gets slash dotted. I don't even know, does that exist anymore? No idea. Um, and then you suddenly get some traffic, and, and start, stuff starts to build up. And we get to a point where we're handling too much data, we're handling too much traffic. You know, in short, our servers, in some way, shape, or form, are under too much load. This normally becomes apparent in kind of like three stages. So first of all, you get kind of slow performance. So everyone, everyone's requests are being fulfilled. However, you know, they're competing for some resources. They're having to wait for a connection to free up to the day space or whatever else. So everything starts to get a, bit, a little bit slower. And people are going, well, yeah, I'm getting my, I'm getting my request. I'm, I'm getting this page I've requested, or I can access the reporting. But it's starting to take a little bit longer. And then you start getting outages. So for some people, it's still fine. Some people can still get onto their dashboard or get onto their web store or are getting their commands delivered or whatever else. But other people are starting to see some errors. Hopefully, you never get onto the last one because you've realized what's happening by this point. But if it goes unchecked for too long, the servers start thrashing, they run out of RAM, and your operating system goes, OK, I'm going to kill the thing with, that's using the most resources. Goodbye, MySQL. It's not a good place to be when you get a phone call at you know, 11 p.m. going, everything's gone. Yeah, you don't want to be doing that. Let's, let's try and sort it before we get to that point. So like I said, if you've got to the point where you're starting to see this stuff, you probably need some kind of quick fixes to buy yourself some time, right? So let's look at some of those first steps. The first thing you can do is what we call separation of concerns. Now, I kind of see some heads nodding anyway, so obviously, I, you know, for a lot of you guys, this probably isn't new. But, you know, we've all done, let's be honest, who's built an application before? It's been wonderful, but they've got one server, and it's running Apache or Nginx, and it's running MySQL, and it's running Redis on, on one box. Yeah. <laughs> we've, all, you know, we've all done it. And that's, that's okay. That's a perfectly legitimate way to start. But actually, being able to split some of, the, of those things up means that A, you can allocate resources where it's needed. So actually, if you look and go, well, actually, my, my database is, is struggling, but my, 
you know, web node is fine. You can split onto two. You can throw some more resources at your database, pair back on what's been given to the web node, and again, you've bought yourself that little bit of time. It means that you can scale the parts of the application that actually need it, not just throwing metal at everything, because that's a waste of money. The other thing means that if, if God forbid, something does go down, it doesn't take everything else with it. Uh, before I was working at TEDx, I, I, for my sins, worked at a uh, Magento shop. Uh, I know, I'm sorry. And we had a, a, a particular customer where every 13 minutes past, every four hours, the site would just go really slow. And exactly 13 minutes past. So it was 13 minutes past four, 30 minutes past eight, 30 minutes past 12, whatever. And the reason for it, we found after well, about 10 seconds, because it was a very specific time, was that there was a, uh, basically a scheduled task, a cron task that ran every four hours, because their back office system kind of gave us all its data in XML, and, and lots of it. So you know, they had their products, that was fine, but it wouldn't say the color's red, it had a color code. So for something like red, it was fine, because the color code was red. You could kind of guess what it was. But they wouldn't tell us when they were creating new ones. So one day you'd get one that, you know, the color code was BLWH, which was black and white. Obviously, right? But it then meant, so we had to then fetch the color XML file to work out which ones are which. Obviously, we had the ones that we knew about, we had stored, but we had to fetch that XML file as well. And sizes, and washing instructions, and what happens if you give it to your gran on a Tuesday, you know, whatever. So there was a lot of stuff, and it meant that this process was burning through four and a half gig of RAM. Which is why everything else stopped. <laughs> it wasn't actually like making a problem to the database. It wasn't, um, you know, crashing the database or anything like that. It was just burning through resources. So obviously it needed to be optimized, and we needed to do a better job of building it, but that was, that was going to take some time. So what did we do as a short-term solution? Went to Linode, got a four gig uh, virtual server from Linode that cost like $20 a month or something, stuck it on there, and that ran away happily, and the rest of the website was fine. And then it gave us the time, it bought us that time to then do a proper job of fixing that script. And this is the same thing. Of course, it doesn't just have to be kind of web and DB and things like that. If you've got different parts to your system, so like I said before, we've got web stores and we've got the admin panel and we've got the control panel, think about you know, splitting those up. So you know, have a separate platform for your web panel, have a separate platform for your server command delivery network, whatever. That's not something we can do with our current one, but that is something that we've kind of looked at and gone, yeah, we really should have done that. So that's what we're going to do next time around. Next thing you can look at is optimization. Now, you might argue, oh, well, that's optimization. It's not really scaling. But if you're saying, well, scaling is being able to serve more requests, then it kind of is. Um, the thing you need to do here is look at what is using up your resources. So use something like New Relic. New Relic, I think, is brilliant. You know, if, if, if New Relic could pay me to run around the country saying how wonderful it was, I would probably do it. Um, even if it was naked or something, I don't know. Um, but you know, New Relic is awesome. Your slow query logs in MySQL, they're all good things. Consider what is burning those resources, like I said. Because you might have something, you might have a query, for example, that takes 40 seconds to run. But if you're running it once a day, when the server's quiet, yes, you could probably get around, look at it at some point, but it's probably not a problem. But if you've got a query that's taking half a second to run, but you're running it 20 times a second, then you're probably screwed. Um, and that's the one, so that's what, you know, even though the, the individual time is less, add it all together, that's what's causing the problems, that's what you need to focus your efforts on first. Um, so yeah, look at that and tackle the common bottlenecks. An interesting kind of example of this, um, as hopefully, you know, some of you guys have heard of the M plus one issue. I've seen some nodding heads and some wry smiles. Awesome. Um, so the M plus one issue is something that's common if you're using an RM. Because an ORM will say, I've got this, this model, and I want to relate it to this other model, and here's the relationship, and, and then it'll give you a way to access that relationship. Which makes life brilliant when you're writing code, because you can just do all this stuff and not really have to think about it. Until you do. Um, so, we're 16 slides in now. We're actually going to look at some code. 
It's a PHP conference with code people. Yeah, it's, it's, it's four lines. It's not good. It doesn't get any better from here. Um, so this is a good example that where you know, we're grabbing some users. So we're just assuming we've got a, a table, a user table, and we've got users by company. So there should be a space after the comma. Um, so we're, we're getting the users where the company, presumably an ID or some form of indicator, is five. And we're going to grab that. And then in our view, so this is probably on a separate, a separate file, some front-end genius has gone, oh, I want to show the, um, the name of the department. So I know I can grab the related department, and I can grab the name. So far, so good. Except the way that that works is for each user, it's going to do another database query to fetch the department. So if you've got six users, probably not a problem, right? If you've got 1,000 users or 5,000 users, I'm probably going to be knocking on your door you know, with, an, with a torch and pick for, pitchfork or something. It's a lot of queries. It gets worse. If you remember, I said that our kind of paid uh, plans, they can build their own templates that are in Twig. So yeah, this happens. So now someone's gone, well, actually, now I want to know the supervisor of the department of the user. So now you're going to have a query to get the department. Now, now Eloquent is clever. It will cache the department. It knows you've got the department. So the second time, it doesn't need to do it. But it does need to do another query to get the supervisor. So you've now got 5,000 users. So you did one query to get the user, 5,000 queries to get the departments, and 5,000 queries to get the supervisors. I've just done 10,001 uh, 10, queries. Happy days. Yeah. <laughs> so what you would do in an ideal world is you'd go, well, no, I know what these relationships are. And most RRMs will give you a way to eagle load them. So you can say, when you get your collection, well, I want you to load the departments, and I want you to load the department supervisors. And then what it'll do is it'll do one query with a load of IDs, and it'll fetch them all in one go. Nice and efficient. Except it changes over time. So someone will add a relationship in and probably not tell you. That happens all the time. Or equally, you had a relationship that you were using, and then someone changes the view, so you no longer need it. But you're now still loading that, you're running that query anyway. So what we did, uh, rather than trying to go through our entire code base and find them all, which would have taken a little while, is we wrote uh, an extension to the eloquent model. And what it basically does is it checks if the model is part of a collection, is a child of a collection, which in itself, Laravel doesn't let you do, so I had to add that too. But if it is, if it's part of a collection and you ask for a relationship, rather than just loading that one, it loads it on the whole collection. So again, it goes back to doing that one query. It was actually fairly straightforward to do. Um, I did it on a, a flight back from, from Canada. And there's obviously there's some extra code to assign it to a collection, so this parent collection isn't in Laravel by default. But that's something we added. It checks if it's in there, and if it is in a collection, it actually loads the relationship on the collection, not on the model. Instantly, we cut the number of queries we were running by about 70%. <laughs> so we've done some, you know, some, I guess, quick fixes, things that you can go away and apply. You've kind of stopped people from trying to hammer your door down. You've bought yourself a little, little bit of breathing space. Good. So what can we do now? Because this is really only a temporary fix. You know, there's, there's obviously much, many more things that we can do to fix it longer term. So one of the things you're probably going to look at is hardware scaling. Now, hardware scaling can be very straightforward. Honest, it can, it can. But you just need to kind of think about it and, and plan it out before you kind of dive in with both feet. Again, as we said before, what's the thing that needs to scale? If you've got a web node that looks like it's running slow, is it actually the web node that's running slow? Or is it that it's waiting for the database and it's making it look like it's running slow? You need to, again, go back to something like New Relic and work out where the bottlenecks are. Because if, you, if it's actually the DB that's running slow, you can throw as much metal as you want at the web node and it's not going to make a jot of difference. So just often it will be the database. That tends to be the thing that gives up first. Not always, but yeah, most of the time. But just make sure you are scaling the correct thing. So the first thing we're going to look at is vertical scaling. Now, vertical scaling is really, really easy. Basically, it just means a bigger server. So you've got a server that's this big. You get a server that's this big. And 
Certainly if you're using cloud infrastructure, that's normally a case of going, done. It's straightforward, yeah? Um, it's pretty much a one-way transaction. It's, if you've scaled up, it's, it is possible to scale down, but you don't really want to be sitting there and going, oh, it's, it's suddenly got busy, let's scale up again. Oh, it's quiet again, let's scale down. It's kind of once you've done it, you're kind of more or less accepting that's it. Uh, unless, I guess, you have like long, uh, long peaks. So that if you know you're busy throughout November and December, you might then go, well, we'll give it some more resources now and then turn it off for the rest of the year. Okay, maybe you could do that, but if you've got kind of daily peaks and troughs, that's not going to work. A single server is still a point of failure. So if you've got one web server, it doesn't matter how much resource you've thrown at it, if it goes down, that's it. You've got no redundancy. So it works, it's a quick fix, but it has a lot of kind of downsides. So the thing that you're more likely to look at is horizontal scaling. So what that basically means is rather than get, making a server bigger, you just have more servers and you spread the load out. Um, that's what we're doing at Tebex. So you know, we have a horizontal cluster of servers for web. We have a separate horizontal uh, cluster of servers for database. Um, we've got two Redis servers that work in parallel. Um, and yeah, so that's what we do. We're going to look at horizontal scaling of web services first which means you know there's a brilliant story coming up. Um, but yeah, it, it, again, as, as long as you put a load balancer in so you can distribute that traffic, scaling out web nodes horizontally is not too difficult. The only thing you might have to consider is if your application is doing things like storing to the file system. So if you're uploading images and storing them to your file system, and then you scale out horizontally, you'll upload them to server A, you'll be on server B and go, where's my images? But that's, that's yeah, fairly easily fixable. Either upload them to S3 instead, or upload them to a shared NAS drive, or you know, there's, there's lots of ways you can get around that. Likewise, if you're storing your sessions on the file system, that doesn't work, so stick them in Redis. Um, but apart from that, you can then add and, add and remove nodes, and it makes it redundant, because if you've got, say, three web nodes, and one drops off, yes, the other two are gonna have to work harder, but it's not just a complete blackout. And they will probably, you know, hopefully they'll carry on you know, struggling along until you can bring another node back up and all joy is restored. So it probably looks something like this. Like we said, you've got two load balancers. Uh, we just use HA proxy, but actually if you're using like AWS, in fact, even DigitalOcean, I got an email the other day, I think they're now doing managed load balancers. It's only taken how many years. Uh, and then that then distributes the traffic between your nodes, so it'll check that they're healthy and it'll go, there's a request for you, there's a request for you, and there's a request for you. And it keeps going, and everything is good in the world. Databases. We love databases. Uh, scaling databases, to put it nicely, is something that's quite hard to do well. Um, when I was doing some research for this talk, there's actually a blog post I came across where the title is, Relational DBs are not designed to scale. <laughs> it's like, Great, thanks for that. That's basically, I'm going to go home now then. Um, there are a few ways to go about it. Um, the two common ones, as it says there, are sharding and, and replication. But whatever you do, there tends to be compromises. As I said, I'm not going into too much detail, so this is a very brief introduction to sharding, mainly because if you don't already know what sharding is and therefore don't have a huge engineering department, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, you know, if you're Google, you're Facebook, or, or you know, Sam knows, whatever else, then great, go ahead and do it. If there's four developers, you're going to break stuff. Uh, what sharding basically does is you have many databases, but each database only has some of the data. So you first of all have to say, right, well, how are we going to split this data up? And people will go, well, I know, I'll do it by date. So stuff that gets added this year gets added in this database. And the stuff that gets added the next year is added in that database. And based on, on their, th when they were added, they can do that. And that's fine. But So you've got a customer who joined in 2014. So it's in the 2014 database. But now he's adding some new products in 2017. What database do you put those products in? Because if you put them in the 2017 database, you're then having to do cross-database queries to get the user and the products. And they might still have some products that are in a different database. And, and the categories might be in another database, and it's not going to work. Um, or so you go, OK, no, so I'll do it based on the user's ID. So, so the, the user ID and all their stuff gets put in that same, that same uh, shard. Well, OK, but what if you've got a user that has, or an account that has multiple team members? 
and one of their team members has an ID of 10, so it's in the first partition, or one of their users has a partition of, uh, an ID of 4,000, so it's in a later partition. So now you're still doing those. So I think the point I'm making is that coming up with a, an effective sharding system is really difficult. I've never done it. I wouldn't try to do it. So yeah, it is possible. And if you've exhausted all other options, then pay a consultant a shed load of money, and they'll come and do it for you. Um, but yeah, I would stay away from it as much as possible. Replication. Now, this, this is a bit more straightforward. On replication, every database has a complete copy of all the data. Um, so it means that you can query any of the database instances. It doesn't matter whether it's database A or database Z. Uh, and you'll get the same data out of it, in theory. <laughs> when we talk about replication, we're normally talking about master-slave. So what this means is you have a database that is the master, and all the writes get sent to that database. So anytime you're doing an insert or an update or a delete, it gets sent to your master database. Then as those, those changes are then replicated across your infrastructure to all the slave databases. So they all then get up to date. Normally this happens quickly, within 10 milliseconds or so, but not always. <laughs> We had, I think, at one point, uh, we had a, a lag of about 40 seconds. Wasn't a good day. Uh, which then meant, you know, that common thing where you do an insert, you get an insert ID back, and then you redirect them to slash user slash ID, no data. Because it's now gone to a different node that doesn't have that data, and it all falls over. That's obviously workaroundable. That's not even a word. You can get around that um, by you know, holding that data or caching it or whatever else. So there, again, there are ways to fix that. You just have to consider those things as you're kind of building your replication in. However, you've probably noticed that you've still only got one master. So you've only got one point you can write to. If you've got a read-heavy application like a Magento web store, then it's not a problem. That's, that's not an issue, because you're doing mostly reads anyway. But if you've got a write-heavy write -heavy application like we do, that still doesn't really solve your problems. So we want to master, master replication. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this is going to be good. Um, we, we did some research. And we went, oh, yes, uh, Galera. Yes, that's definitely what we want to do. Uh, and what that does is I think it's something that's by Pocona that gives you nearly synchronous replication. Now, there's a term and a half. Donald Trump would be proud. <laughs> nearly synchronous replication. What it means is that you can insert on or do any, any write uh, command on any database. And it'll get sent across to all the other databases, but you won't get collisions, you won't get ID crashes or anything like that, and it's all wonderful. The way it works is a transaction isn't considered closed until the replication is complete. <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, we use HAProxy to balance our nodes. So we, we literally fired in sequence and went, right, query for you, query for you, query for you. That didn't work, so we updated it to go, well, actually, let's look at the one that's least busy. Query for you, query for you, query for you, and so on. Notice how I use the word had. Yeah, it didn't work very well. <laughs> Basically, what happened was that our uh, writes was so frequent, and we were having some network latency issues that none of the transactions were closing. <laughs> and then, so what happens is, 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 is you know, Galera's quite good. It'll go, well, hang on, I can't guarantee consistency here, so I'm just going to stop all the writes. <laughs> And then all the processes wait because they go, well, I need to write. And he goes, well, hang on, wait a minute. Yeah, but I need to write something. Yeah, but you need to wait. And then it all falls over. So as a temporary solution, we went back to our good old trusty vertical scaling, got the biggest node that DigitalOcean could give us at $320 a month, and just threw it at the database. And, and that got us through. It got us through kind of Black Friday and Cyber Monday, which is not a time when you want your data sources to be going down, incidentally. Don't do it then. <laughs> Uh, and, and that kind of got us through. And now what we've done is we've gone back to that whole kind of having a compromise. We've actually used to move to Amazon Aurora, which is a drop-in replacement for MySQL, so all your queries still work. Um, everything works exactly the same way. But because of, they've basically got their own custom storage engine, and it means that the throughput for writes is massively better. 
Um, so again, we've gone back to we can only have read replicas, but they are very low latent latency because AWS's network tends to be pretty good. Um, but we've got plenty of excess throughput on Aurora, and we're not even on their biggest machine, so we're okay for now. By doing that and having that read replica, you still do have that failover. And actually, with AWS, it will do it automatically for you anyway, which is quite nice, because if the master goes down, it will promote one of the slaves, and that becomes the new master. And because we're just pointing it to a load balancer, it knows which one's the master, and it, it routes all the traffic properly, and everything is good again, as they say. So that's what we've done for databases. On the new product, as I've already said, we're splitting it up anyway. So we're going to have separate databases and a whole separate infrastructure for authentication, a whole separate infrastructure for web stores, for the control panel, for the server delivery. So A, we can scale them all separately, and we'll have a lot more resources anyway, because actually the job of each database will be significantly smaller, uh, which is good. So we've now scaled out. We've gone to our boss and gone, right, I need four times the hosting budget, which has gone down like a lead balloon. Uh, so what else can we do? Rather than just throwing metal at it ad infinitum, there's got to be something else we can do, right? And there is. Caching. Basically, caching makes stuff really fast. That's, that, that sums it up. Um, what caching effectively does is means you're using less resources because you're not generating stuff. Because we all know dynamic content is bad. Which is funny, bearing in mind I'm a PHP developer speaking to a room of PHP developers. But anytime you can serve, serve static content, that's going to be better. It's going to be faster. So anything that you're doing that requires work, whether that's you know, querying a database, whether that's going to a third-party API, like I said, we use Keen for reporting, but it means we're still sending stuff across the net, waiting for responses back. Even if it's just as simple as going through a loop, that stuff takes time. So if you've got something where you know actually the end result's going to be the same on more than one occasion, don't bother wasting those resources and wasting that processing power and that processing time and that mem uh, memory and whatever else. Use a cache and just serve that. Cache all the things. OK, that's a slight exaggeration, but you know, I had to have all the things in there somewhere, right? <laughs> So you don't want to cache everything, but it, it is a case of working out what, is, what it makes sense to cache. So if you've got something that is only generated once every 24 hours, and it's only read, looked at once every 24 hours, then you probably don't need to cache it. If, if you know there's a report that the boss looks at once a day, and he goes, and he gives him a report, and he prints it, because you know what, the bosses hate trees, um, then you may as well just, you know, there's no point caching that, it's a waste. However, if you've got something that, you know, it might change every minute, but in that minute it's being requested 60 times, then generate it once and cache it for a minute, and, and then generate it again the next minute. That makes sense. How you do your cache is entirely up to you. We use Redis. Uh, people use Memcache. I mean, to be honest, just you know, writing stuff to a text file is better than having no cache at all. Don't write stuff to a text file. Uh, but whatever you do, however you do it, some cash is better than no cash. So we've already kind of touched upon this. How long should we cash stuff for? Unfortunately, I'm going to say it depends. I'm going to sit right on the fence because you know I'm British and that's what I'm good at. Um, if you've got stuff that you know doesn't change, if you've got static HTML pages, then cash them forever. In actual fact, just cash it, and then when someone makes a change in your CMS, then invalidate the cash. You don't need to set an expiry on it. If, if it can only change if someone changes it in the admin panel, just cache it for 59 million years, and then worry about it when someone makes a change, and then invalidate it at that point. If you've got stuff like reporting, yes, it's lovely if reporting is real time, but if you're pulling stuff over APIs and it's slow, it's not going to happen. We kind of had a conversation with some of our biggest partners and said, well, we're going we're to give you updated reporting every 15 minutes. And a couple of them moaned and went, well, how dare you do this? And we went, well, if you want to pay 10 times as much, then we'll give you real-time reporting. And their answer was, oh, no, no, 15 minutes is fine. <laughs> so, you know, if you can do real-time, then, you know, do it. That's awesome, and your customers will love you, and, you know, whatever. But if it's a choice between having all your customers leave you when you say, right, now pay us £5,000 a month, or 
giving them an updated, you know, updated statistics every 15 minutes, then that's a, that's a, val a valid trade-off. Even if you've got something that can only be cached for a minute, if it's being requested more than once, more or less, then it's worth doing. The other thing that you might do is pre-warp your cache. So at the moment, you're saying, right, so we're going to cache, but someone has to hit that web page first. And try, you know, we all try and make wonderfully optimized code, and it's all brilliant, and everything loads really quickly. But let's face it, it doesn't always happen. And certainly, if you, if you like, let's say you use Magento. Um, Things like the home page tend to just be really slow anyway. So rather than making the first person pay that price for it not being cached, if you've got quiet periods in the evening, pre-warm your caches. So just you know, automatically hit those pages so they're stored in cache, and then your cache is there. So when, so when an actual person comes to it, they go, here's the cache version. Aren't I clever? And they never know. We, like I said, used to use it at my old place when we were doing Magento. Um, so we basically would know what the top 100 products were. So every four hours, I think, we'd go and pre-warm that cache. We knew what the top categories were, we'd pre-warm those, and we'd pre-warm the homepage. And clients would come to us and go, wow, my site's really quick. I'm like, yeah, we're good. We're good like that. Just don't, oh, this has been recorded, isn't it? <laughs> so caching, that's definitely a good thing. The last kind of thing I want to look at is, is threat protection. Now. As I kind of mentioned early on, we have this kind of ongoing bubble of um, quasi-attacks, failed attacks, overly optimistic attacks, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it means that there can be quite a lot of background noise. They're not necessarily just attacks. You could have, if you've got an API and someone's written a really, really, really horrible client, which we've had people do this, where we weren't throttling API requests and they were hitting it 80 times a second each, <laughs> uh, rogue crawlers from those dodgy search engines in Russia or whatever else. Uh, whatever that might be, that stuff is just adding to your overheads and you're having to process that. If, if you don't know it's happening, it means that you're spending resources satisfying this just ongoing stuff. Um, so if we can sort that, we can then basically that, and it might not be a lot, you might, you might have a few thousand, or you might have hundreds of thousands, or you might have millions. But yeah, you can stop all that stuff, and then all that, resource, all that resource that was being used up is now available for your actual customers. As I mentioned, rate limiting. Um, consider what's reasonable. In our instance, 80 requests a second was not reasonable. Um, I think it's now down to about 15, I think. Um, but if you've got an API, or even if you've got your web, if you, you know, your web application, if you know that no one could possibly be generating 50 requests a second, and people are generating 50 requests a second, then just block them. However you do that is entirely up to you. I mean, in an, an old place, we used to use fail to ban, so we used to use these scan the logs, and when we saw an IP that was making lots of requests, we'd stick it in IP tables. That works. If you want to use something like Cloudflare, then use that. Um, Sometimes you have to kind of do it in a, a bit of a piecemeal way. So for example, if you've got an API, you might have one piece of the API that you know people shouldn't be hitting more than once every 10 minutes, say. So yeah, okay, you probably wouldn't rate limit to once every 10 minutes, but you can be a lot more aggressive on the rate limiting than something you know people need to hit every minute. Or in our case, the fact that different plans have different numbers of refreshes, so we actually have different rate limits depending on how much money you give us. Um, as I said, Cloudflare, not only is it good for kind of stopping a lot of those kind of DDoSs or kind of layer 7s or even kind of infrastructure attacks, because they just deal with all that stuff at the edge, it also will cache static pages, uh, images, it provides a CDN. Um, so it'll give you a lot of protection against kind of different things. They share the information, so if there's a particular profile of a, you know, a type of attack or an attack vector that's being used against lots of their customers, it will automatically block that against anyone. So even if someone else has suffered, we kind of get the benefit, which is great. Um, but yeah, definitely, something like Cloudflare, there are alternatives available, um, of course. I don't know what they are. Um, but definitely, something like that is, is well worth looking at. So, in an ideal world, you know, we would all look at scaling when we build an application. It's not. <laughs> 
You don't have time. You have pressures. You've got your boss going, no, I need this yesterday. We need to launch by this big conference or whatever else. So, you know, let's be honest with ourselves. It's probably not going to happen. However, even if you haven't done that, even if you know, you're a month down the line or six months down the line or years down the line, there's plenty of stuff you can do. There's stuff that you could go and do today. So the thing that is important, and I've said this a few times, is measure stuff, benchmark stuff, profile stuff, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Use something like New Relic. Or even, you know, there's plenty of good um, tools within kind of Linux and Unix systems. You know, using SAR is better than not using anything. Uh, using the slow query log is better than not using anything. So there's definitely ways that you can work out where the problems lie. Then isolate those problems. You know, like I said before, there's no point throwing metal at a web node if the DB is crashing. It's not going to do anything. So isolate things off. Go, well, I know this is a problem. I know that these crons are a problem. I know that this database is a problem. Isolate that stuff off and then focus your efforts and your resources on the bits that are the problem. Thank you very much. So we've got some time for questions. You know, once we're finished, please do rate this. Um, I am also the maintainer for joined in, so a little plug, we always, always, always need more contributors. Or equally, if you want to bitch about something we've done wrong, then come and see me, that's absolutely fine. Um, I'll be around for the rest of the day, speak to me, catch me on Twitter, email me, whatever else. Any questions? Stunned silence. <laughs> no? Not even what's the meaning of life? No. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. in places where that isn't necessary? Yeah, so for anyone who couldn't hear that, wait, so what the question was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that, obviously, we talked about the M plus one issue and our solution for that, and whether there were any kind of negative impacts of that and whether we'd looked at those. Um, because of the way our application works, if something's in a collection and the relationship is being loaded, it's about a 95% chance we're looping the thing. So we're going to need all those relationships anyway. But you might have issues. If you've got stuff that you kind of paginate after relationships load, then I guess you'd have a problem there. I mean, whenever we've got pagination, we take the slice of the collection first. So we'd still only be loading the relationship on 25 records or 50 records or whatever, whatever a page was. Um, so in that sense, because we're doing it as part of the loop, we don't have those issues because we, we know we're using it in a loop anyway. If I guess you were loading a, a collection of 50 and only using the first item, then you need to consider that. But then I would suggest you probably don't need to be loading the collection of 50 in the first place, potentially. Okay, so the question again was, um, how do you cache kind of third-party APIs if we kind of have millions of sales? Uh, and the short answer is, we, we actually cache the output that we generate. So when someone says, I want the statistics for my web store, we'll go off, we'll go to Keen, we'll pull that data in. Uh, and, and I mean, the, the key, you know, when I say they're slow, I'm talking maybe half a second slow, I'm not talking hours. Um, but then we'll use that and we take that data and we format that into something that we can inject into our graph building uh, JavaScript library that I've never looked at. Oh, and that's what we cache, so we'll cache that array. Um, so we don't cache the raw data coming in, we'll generate that report and we'll cache the result for that. And then so, because that's on their dashboard, every time they get to their dashboard they then just get that cached data graph for 15 minutes. Anything else? People are escaping. Well, thank you very much.